Uh, I used to go to the Jewish National School just off South Circular Road near Leonard's Corner in Dublin. Zion Schools. It was a long time ago in the 50s, and I was four years old then, and I stayed there until I was 12. I played with my friend up the road in his house in Bloomfield Avenue. The current incumbent is Paul Gillespie, past editor of the Irish Times. My young friend, however, was the son of the then Irish chief Rabbi Jacobowitz, who later went on to become chief rabbi of the UK and Commonwealth. And he was made a lord knighted by Margaret Thatcher. In the same house some years earlier resided chief rabbi Isaac Herzog, who became the first Ashkenazi chief rabbi of the newly formed State of Israel. His son Chaim Herzog also lived in the house and went to Wesley College. Chaim Herzog served as the only Irishman to be the president of another country, the sixth president of the State of Israel. Only 10 days ago, his son, Isaac Herzog, named after his grandfather, was sworn in as the 11th president of the State of Israel. I was a typical young student when I went to design schools, and I looked something like the photo that you see on the cover, on the sleeve of Angela's Ashes. I had a cap, I had short pants, I had a shirt, and the obligatory home-knitted Fair Isle vest for warmth. But unlike the boy on the cover, I had long socks and scuffed shoes. In that large square box of a school still standing on Bloomfield Avenue, I and my contemporaries were taught by a gaggle of wonderful teachers, the like of which would not, I guess, be found in any school today. There was little Mrs. O'Connor, who taught everything, Oskelga. There was Mr. Edwards, an avowed communist, and only employable by the Irish Jewish community, who returned from the Spanish War and would have been glad to be interred with the dog Laia that the Soviets put up into space in a Sputnik in 1957. There was Joe Barron of Clan na Publichta, hoping to one day to get a Doyle seat, or even one on Dublin City Council as a consolation prize. He achieved the Doyle seat. There were several other teachers with the 15 inch long, one inch thick black strap made of flexible leather that they kept snaked up their shirts to be taken out to wallop a young student to satisfy their all too frequent bouts of sadism, perhaps sometimes to make up for their lack of teaching skills. Of course, there was a concrete yard where we played football each day with a tennis ball, where we'd frequently fall and cut ourselves on the hard concrete surface. And Brenda, if the concrete culture had been alive then, I would have knees that would have earned me a large pension by now. Ah, but they were the good old days when the boys played football in one yard and the girls skipped rope in another, and we didn't give a thought of gender fluidity. There was, of course, several teachers of Hebrew. Now, when I say Hebrew, I mean not just how to read the ancient script of the Torah, the Bible, but also its stories, its narratives, the learning, the famous and the flawed characters, and our connection to over 3,000 years and to the land of our forefathers. This religious tutelage was called cheder. And it carried on the tradition of teaching young minds that was a connection also to our not too distant past in Poland or Lithuania, or other never spoken about places, despite the constant reminder in the accents of our parents or grandparents. Cheder was the space, the room, the place, as was the home, where we inserted the shared events of the past, past millennia of a wandering nation into our pliable, developing memories, where we inserted the hopes and aspirations for our futures. 
Cheder was where we were in awe of the miracle of a Jewish nation where we returned to a homeland officially declared by the UN less than 10 years previously after wandering 2,000 years in a wilderness of mainly European civilizations that were every bit as harsh as the 40 years of wandering in the desert in biblical times. Cheder was where we were given posters for our bedroom walls of swarthy Jewish males and svelte Jewish women driving tractors. Jewish farmers? Who would have guessed while sitting at our wooden desks with little wells for the porcelain white pots that held our quill-branded ink in which to dip our steel nibs and were split down the middle to hold the fluid? Yes, Jewish farmers. In this environment, we were inculcated with the dignity of human life, the fairness of the justice system of ancient times, which were subsequently adapted and adopted by most of the Western world. The respect for family, for workers, and for animals. We searched for absolute truth, though there was none in any given situation. And we were taught to question and continue to question until we came as close as possible to that elusive truth. Here was the fair-mindedness of what to do in disputes. Here was the justice that needed to be meted out to robbers and thieves and murderers. Here we learned that we must not lie. The truth is all. We must look after one another. The family was paramount. We learned that we can only kill another human being in times of war and with our enemies and only in defense. We learn to be upright citizens of whatever country we happen to find ourselves in, and we learn to look after the stranger in our midst. Here we learn to be upright and righteous and just. Here we learn not only truth, but how to distinguish it. All this stemming from the original roadmap for self and social justice a roadmap for living together, a template, the Ten Original Tweets, the Ten Commandments. Another of my teachers was a Mr. Cassidy. It is because of his years of schooling me that I always parse sentences almost to my own annoyance, especially when I listen to RTE newscasters to, term, to determine if the words they are reading or saying actually mean what they or the script writers intend them to mean. I find that on many occasions, when the truth is hiding, one has to be particularly attentive to realize that. But where? Where is the truth hiding? I will mention by way of examples how the media and politicians, especially in Ireland, treat the ongoing situation of what used to be called the Arab-Israeli conflict, but since 1967, it is called the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But I need to declare my interests. I will use a term you may not have heard of previously. I am a pro-Palestinian Zionist. One who believes that the Palestinians and Israelis should both have their own states and live in peace and harmony with each other, be allowed to bring up their children and to earn a living. The funny thing is, is that the majority of Israeli Jews and diaspora Jews believe exactly the same. So I'm going to pose a few questions and give a few answers, each of which can be simply verified from a myriad of sources. In 1948, it is recognized fact that approximately 640,000 Arabs left what is now Israel. Would you be aware that these 640,000 have now grown into approximately 5.5 million, according to UNRWA? UNRWA is a United Nations quango, and UNRWA stands for the United Nations Works and Relief Agency. And there is, according to estimates, only approximately 20,000 of the original 740,000 refugees left. But we're told that there's 5.5 million refugees. In fact, as Kevin, uh, Kevin Myers told me last year, our own Ministry of Foreign Affairs upped the number by 100,000 from one year to the next which was quite peculiar because neither Kevin or I knew that Israel expelled extra Arabs. Of course, they didn't. No, the population just grew. 
So how can the number of refugees rise from 740,000 in 1948 to 5.5 million in 73 years? Again, the truth is hiding in plain sight, but never spoken about, especially by UNRWA and especially by the media and especially by our politicians. Did you know, were you aware, that the refugee status for Palestinians passes from generation to generation? Forever, with no stopping it. Why? Well, the answer again is in plain sight, if you know where to look. But why aren't we told by our media and our politicians? There are two agencies set up by the UN. One is UNRWA, which I mentioned, whose sole responsibility, sole responsibility is to look after the Palestinians, and it has not solved the problem since it was set up just after 1948. The other is the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. The UNHCR's responsibility is to look after all other refugees in the world. Guess what? Did you know that they've completed their job successfully every time there are refugees anywhere? They've completed their job within 10 to 15 years. And that includes situations such as a post-war or World War II when millions of Germans, Poles, Czechs, etc., swapped territories, people moved. It includes millions, approximately 15 million, of Indian and Pakistani, uh, Pakistanian people, uh, where people were disenfranchised and moved to other territories, and their refugee status was removed, and they no longer live in refugee camps and are citizens of their new country. And let's ask the question about the Palestinian refugees under UNRWA. If they are living in the West Bank and Gaza, or are citizens of Jordan, as many are, surely these are not classed as refugees. Wrong, they are. Do you feel that it is strange that you can be a refugee in your own country? Do you feel it's strange that you can be a refugee and a citizen of another country, like Jordan or maybe the US? So I ask myself, why isn't refugee status removed so that we can really see the extent of the Palestinian problem and try and solve it? There are several thousand Palestinians in refugee camps, several hundreds of thousands in refugee camps in Lebanon, where their saviors, the terror organi organization Hezbollah, financed by Iran, won't let them have citizenship or won't let them work or own their own businesses outside of their camps. The same is true of Syria. So, I ask the following questions. Why is the West supporting all this? Why are we in Ireland funding with taxpayer money millions of euro to UNRWA, an entity that allows Hamas to store weapons under schools and hospitals? Why are we letting Hamas at this very moment, this, as I'm speaking, train 10,000 children from the age of five in summer camp to be terrorists, to kill Israelis and Jews and themselves. To me, this is child abuse of the grossest nature. Why are we not saying to our government, disband UNRWA, stop two of our NGOs, especially Trokera, from dictating foreign policy to our government when it comes to funding these atrocities? Why are we not listening to people like Einat Wilf, who is an ex-member of the Israeli Knesset, who writes in her book, War of Return, that so long as the West keeps alive the hope of each and every one of those 5.5 million so-called refugees, plus the unborn refugees, that they will have the ability to return to their grandparents or great-grandparents' home in Israel, there will never, ever be peace. Why are you not told that of all the Arab countries, the Palestinians pro rata of all the Arab countries have both the lowest infant mortality as well as the highest number of third level educated people. Let's look at Israel. No one says they're perfect. But what other democracy in the world a few weeks ago would have had to put up with 700 rockets in seven hours being fired at them 
and then 4,500 over 11 days. A democracy, a so-called friend of Ireland. Why was our government hiding the truth from us? Why was the media hiding the truth from us? These facts were hardly mentioned. And when they were, the victim, Israel, was to blame. How mad is that? Why is Israel vilified at the UN, the only country in the world to have a permanent place on the agenda where human, its human rights, so-called violations, are discussed permanently? It's sheer madness cloaked in the frame of human rights. It is anti-Semitism. You may say the criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitism, and of course, not all criticism is. It is interesting to note that back when the newly formed state of Israel was held in high esteem by Irish people, we as youngsters, as well as our secular teachers, held our collective breaths as Israel, the underdog, saw off the surrounding hordes in war after war. The Irish propensity to champion the underdog was the Trojan horse that enabled the Irish media and hence the politicians to switch sides and believe that the Jews no longer required anyone in their corner. It's quite peculiar that many people believe that only the poor and the downtrodden are worthy of attention. Sympathy seemingly never gets traded up. Now, today's anti-Semitism, especially in Ireland, manifests itself as anti-Israel or anti-Zionism. One of the great Jewish thinkers and philosophers of our time was the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who sadly passed away the last year. A number of years ago, while speaking in the European Parliament, he asks how anti-Semitism has now turned into anti-Zionism. How did this happen? He postulated that it happened the way all viruses always defeat the human immune system, namely by mutating. Oh, how we know about that today. The new anti-Semitism is a mutation from the old and is different in three ways. Once Jews were hated because of their religion, then they were hated because of their race, now they are hated because of their nation state. The epicenter of the old anti-Semitism was Europe. Today it's the Middle East, and it is communicated globally by the new electronic media, by social media. Rabbi Sachs went on to say that it is easy to hate, but difficult publicly to justify hate. Throughout history, when people have sought to justify anti-Semitism, they have done so by recourse to the highest source of authority available within the culture. At that time, in the Middle Ages, it was religion, so we'd anti-religious, so we'd religious anti-Judaism. In post-Enlightenment Europe, it was science, so we had the twin foundations of Nazi ideology, social Darwinism, and the so-called scientific study of race. Today, the highest source of authority worldwide is human rights. That is why Israel, the only fully functioning democracy in the Middle East with a free press and an independent judiciary, is regularly accused of the five cardinal sins against human rights. Racism, apartheid, crime against humanity, ethnic cleansing, and attempted genocide. In the Middle Ages, Jews were accused of poisoning wells, spreading the plague, and killing Christian children. In Nazi Germany, they were accused of controlling both capitalist America and communist Russia. Good trick. Today, they're accused of running America. All the old myths have been recycled from the blood libels to the protocols of the elders of Zion. The cartoons that flood the Middle East are clones of those published in Der Sturmer, one of the primary vehicles of Nazi propaganda between 1923 and 1945. The ultimate weapon of the new anti-Semitism is dazzling in its simplicity. It goes like this. The Holocaust must never happen again. But Israelis are the new Nazis. The Palestinians are the new Jews. All real Jews are Zionists. Therefore, real anti-Semites of our time are none other than Jews themselves. And these are not marginal views. They are widespread throughout the Muslim world, including communities in Europe. And they are slowly infecting the far left, the far right, academic circles, unions, and even some churches. 
having cured itself of the virus of anti-Semitism, Europe is being reinforced by parts of the world that never went through self-reckoning that Europe undertook once the facts of the Holocaust became known. Rabbi Sachs asks, how do such absurdities come to be belief? And he responds, when bad things happen to a group, its members can ask two questions. What did we do wrong or who did this to us? The entire faith of that group rests on which it chooses. If it asks, what did we do wrong? It has begun the self-criticism essential to a free society. If it asks, who did this to us? It has defined itself as a victim. It will then seek a scapegoat to blame for all its problems. Classically, this has been the Jews. Jews have been the scapegoats of humanity for millennia. Ironic as the idea of a scapegoat first appears in the Bible to purge oneself of one's sins. So to come back to the so-called justification for anti-Semitism in Ireland, both the media and politicians stumble into anti-Semitic tropes as they are led there by their handlers, mainly from outside this country, who are using Ireland as a backdoor, another Trojan horse, into Europe. For those who doubt, for those who doubt me, please go and listen or read the transcripts in the Dublin City Council, the Senate, and the Dáil whenever Israel and Palestine is debated. We see washed up TV personalities and politicians trying to make a name for themselves, jumping on this bandwagon of feel good humanitarianism, aided and bettered by the local media who enjoy the controversy and outrage and everyone gets a thrill for their act, role and place in virtue signaling our cancel culture. As selling their wares is of course more important than seeking the true facts. We live in a post-truth society where opinion always tops facts. It was Winston Churchill who said of one of his opponents that, I think it hardly possible to speak the opposite of the truth with greater precision. Anti-Semitism has mutated and morphed. No laws preventing us being full citizens of the country but when we or our values get demonized, then the other forms of anti-Semitism, physical forms, are not far behind. All these are manifested strongly on social media by keyboard warriors, many of whom would not express their views anywhere else. I think that is a case of changing the term in vino veritas to in social media veritas. There lies the truth. When we saw the absolute absurdity of condemnation at Disneyland of, of hate and feeding frenzy against Israel in the Dáil a few weeks ago, like no other parliament in the world, which singled out Israel with its delusional promoters believing that they can hurt Israel in some way, when it is spawned by Irish legislators taking a brief from the enemies of Israel, when it does nothing to enhance the lives of the Palestinians whom it purports to help and who deserve better from their own leadership as well when they can willfully distort the facts, one wonders where truth is hiding. We see and hear our media and politicians virtue signaling just to demonstrate their good moral values. Once again, Jews are being scapegoated. Isn't it strange that in fact the thinking of our politician constitutes white saviorism and colonialist thinking towards the Palestinians? They instead ought to be talking about solutions, not problems. So where is the truth actually hiding? I believe that the answer lies in the psychology of persuasion. Here is what Hitler referred to as the grosse lüge, the big lie. The big lie is a gross distortion or misrepresentation of the truth, used especially as a propaganda technique. The German expression coined by Hitler when he dictated his 1925 book, Mein Kampf, to describe the use of a lie as so colossal that no one believed that someone could have the impudence to distort the truth so infamously. 
Hitler claimed the technique was used by Jews to blame Germany's loss in World War I on a German general, Erich Ludendorff, who was a prominent nationalist political leader in the Weimar Republic. Historian Jeffrey Herp says that the Nazis used the idea of the original big lie to turn sentiment against the Jews and bring about the Holocaust. Herp maintains that Joseph Goebbels and the Nazi party actually used the big lie propaganda te technique that they described and that they used it to turn long-standing anti-Semitism in Europe into mass murder. Her further argues that the Nazis' big lie was their depiction of Germany as an innocent, besieged land striking back at an international jury, which the Nazis blamed for starting World War I. Nazi propaganda repeated over and over the claim that Jews had power behind the scenes in Britain, Russia, and the United States. It spread claims that the Jews had begun a war of extermination against Germany, and it used these claims to assert that Germany had a right to annihilate the Jews in self-defense. In short, Nazi fascism hinged on creating one streamlined overarching lie. The Nazis built an ideology on a fiction, the notion that Germany's defeat in World War I could be avenged by purging the German population of those purportedly responsible, the Jews. The US psychological profile of history stated the phrase big lie was also used in report prepared during the war by the United States. The Office of Strategic Services in describing Hitler's psychological profile, profile said this, the primary rules were never allow the public to cool off, never admit a fault or wrong, never concede that there may be some good in your enemy, never leave room for alternatives, never accept blame, concentrate on one enemy at a time and blame him for everything that goes wrong. People will believe a big lie sooner than a little one. So in looking for answers to where the truth is hiding, I find it in the context of Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as the big lie propaganda entity has been adopted by the Palestinians. The big lie is also used against Israel and the Jews by the, Israeli, the Iranians, the PA, the Palestinian Authority, Hezbollah, Hamas, and others. It is used to a much lesser extent in other Arab countries, but was used when they caused 840,000 Jews to leave their lands in 1948 and onwards. 840,000. We talk of the 720, 740,000 Arabs that were leaving Israel. But there was 840,000 Jews in Arab countries, some as many as 120, 150,000 in places like Egypt and Iraq, Iran, all gone. Egypt has one Jew one Jew. Thankfully, currently, there are four Arab countries, UAE, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan and Morocco, who are normalizing relationships with Israel in the Abraham Accords. And the big lie there is currently no longer in play. It is quite amazing that these world-changing deals of friendship and cooperation between countries in the Middle East are hardly mentioned in the Irish media or by our politicians world changing every single person here so why is that well i believe it is quite simple it goes to the very essence of human psychology every single person here that is married or in relationship will know that it is virtually impossible to admit that they are wrong I say that with my wife sitting over there, and it's our 49th anniversary tomorrow. <laughs> we can't admit that we're wrong. It's a loss of face. It's an admission that our calculations on a topic were incorrect or misguided. Our teachers back in school expected us to have the right answer. Do we really want to see that leather strap snaking its way towards us at our age? The odd time that I admit I was incorrect, my wife goes mad. 
because we would rather know, another piece of psychology, we would rather know that the person we're speaking to or the entity that is speaking to us, that we can rely on the facts that they're telling us, especially our partners, our children, and our politicians. We need to know that decisions are correct. This is possibly programmed into us by ancient fight or flight response. This fits in wonderfully to our new social media driven instant gratification post-truth society. The fight or flight response is an automatic physiological reaction to an event that is perceived as stressful or frightening. The perception of threat activates the sympathetic nervous system and triggers an acute stress response that prepares the body to fight or flee. There is no time to change one's mind. Make it up quickly or be eaten. Make it up quickly or miss the next nugget of information on Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, etc. When I change my mind, I've learned to say that it is in the light of new incoming data. We very seldom hear that from our politicians. They stick to their first thoughts, especially if they have a soldier mindset. But they need a scout mindset. Scout, soldier, what am I talking about? Well, are you a soldier or a scout? Your answer to this question says decision-making expert Julia Gallif could determine how clearly you see the world. Here is what Julia has to say. Imagine for a moment you're a soldier in the heat of battle, perhaps a Roman foot soldier, medieval archer or Zulu warrior. Regardless of your time and place, some things are probably constant. Your adrenaline is elevated and your actions stem from your deeply ingrained reflexes, reflexes that are rooted in a need to protect yourself and your side and to defeat the enemy. Now, try to imagine you're in a very different role, the scout. The scout's job is not to attack or defend. It is to understand. The scout is the one uh, going out, mapping the terrain, identifying potential obstacles. Above all, the scout wants to know what's really out there as accurately as possible. In an actual army, both the soldier and the scout are essential. You can also think of the soldier and scout roles as mindsets, metaphors for how all of us process information and ideas in our daily lives. Having good judgment and making good decisions, it turns out, depends largely about which mindset you're in. To illustrate the two mindsets in action, let's look at a case from 19th century France where an innocuous looking piece of torn up paper in a wastebasket launched one of the biggest political scandals in history in 1894. Officers in the French general staff found it in this waste paper basket and when they pieced it back together they discovered that someone in their ranks had been selling military secrets to Germany. They launched a big investigation and their suspicions quickly converged on one man, Alfred Dreyfus. In a sterling record, no past history of wrongdoing, no motive as far as they could tell. However, Dreyfus was the only Jewish officer at that rank in the army. And unfortunately, at that time, the French army was highly anti-Semitic. The other officers compared Dreyfus's handwriting to that on the paper and concluded it was a match, even though outside professional handwriting experts were much less confident about the similarity. They searched Dreyfus's apartment and went through his files looking for signs of espionage. They didn't find anything. This just convinced them that not only was Dreyfus guilty, but he was also sneaky because he cleverly hidden all incriminating evidence. They talked to his former teachers and learned he had studied foreign languages in schools which further demonstrate, demonstrated to them a, de a desire to conspire with foreign governments later in life. His teachers also said that Dreyfus had a good memory, which was highly suspicious and must be a good thing to have if you're a spy. 
The case went to trial and Dreyfus was found guilty. Afterwards, officials took him out into the public square. They ritualistically tore his insignia from his uniform and broke his sword in two. This was called the degradation of Dreyfus. He was sentenced to life in prison imprisonment on the aptly named Devil's Island, this barren rock off the coast of South America. He spent his days there alone, writing letter after letter to the French government, begging them to reopen his case so they could discover his innocence. While you might guess that Dreyfus had been set up or intentionally framed by his fellow officers, historians today don't think that is what um, happened. As far as they can tell, the officers genuinely believed that the case against Dreyfus was strong. They genuinely believed it. So the question arises, what does it say about the human mind with that we can find such paltry evidence to be compelling enough to convict a man? This is the case, this is a case of what scientists refer to as motivated reasoning, a phenomena in which our unconscious motivations, desires, and fears shape the way we interpret the information. Some pieces of information feel like our allies. We want them to win. We want to defend them. And other pieces of information are the enemy, and we want to shoot them down. That's why motivated reasoning is uh, a soldier mindset. While you're n you're, you've never persecuted a French Jewish officer for high treason, you might follow sports or, someone, or know someone who does. When the referee judges your team has committed a foul, for example, you're probably highly motivated to find the reasons that he's wrong. But if he judges that the other team committed a foul, that's a great call. Our judgment is strongly influenced unconsciously by which side we want to win. And this is ubiquitous. This shapes how we think about our health, our relationships, how we decide how to vote, and what we consider fair and ethical. What's most scary to me about motivated reasoning or soldier mindset is just how unconscious it is. We can think we're being objective and fair-minded and still wind up ruining the life of an innocent person like Dreyfus. Fortunately for him, there was also a man named Colonel Picard. He was another high-ranking officer in the French army, and like most people, he assumed Dreyfus was guilty. Also, like most of his peers, he was somewhat anti-Semitic. But at a certain point, Picard began to suspect, what if we're all wrong about Dreyfus? Picard discovered evidence that the spying for Germany had continued even after Dreyfus was in prison. He also discovered that another officer in the army had handwriting that perfectly matched the torn up memo. It took Picard 10 years to clear Dreyfus' name. And for part of that time, he himself was put in prison for the crime of disloyalty to the army. Some people feel that Picard shouldn't be regarded as a hero because he was anti-Semitic. And I agree that that kind of bias is bad, but I believe the fact that Picard was anti-Semitic makes his actions more admirable because he had the same reasons to be biased as his fellow officers, but his mo motivation to find and uphold the truth trumped all that. This particular story may be similar to some of you who have seen the movie or the play, The Twelve Angry Men. To me, Picard is a poster child for what I call the scout mindset. The drive not to make one idea win or another lose, but to see what's there as honestly and accurately as you can, even if it's not pretty or convenient or pleasant. I've spent the last few years examining a scout mindset, says Julia, and figuring out why some people, at least sometimes, seem able to cut through their own prejudices, biases, and motivations, and attempt to see the facts and the evidence as objectively as they can. The answer she found is emotional. Scout mindset means seeing what there, uh, what's there as accurately as you can, even if it's not pleasant. Just as soldier mindset is rooted in emotional responses, scout mindset is too. But it's simply rooted in different emotions. 
For example, scouts are curious. They are more likely to say they feel pleasure when they learn new information or solve a puzzle. They are more likely to feel intrigued when they encounter something that contradicts their expectations instead of reinforces them. Scouts also have different values. They are more likely to say things, uh, to say they think it's virtuous to test their own beliefs. And they're less likely to say that someone who changes their mind seems weak. And above all, scouts are grounded, which means their self-worth as a person isn't tied to how right or wrong they are on any particular topic. For example, they can believe that capital punishment works. And if studies come out that show it doesn't, they can say, ah, looks like I might be wrong. Doesn't mean I'm a bad or stupid. This cluster of traits is what researchers have found, and Julia found, anecdotally, predicts good judgment. The key takeaway about the traits associated with scout mindsets it is they have little to do with how smart you are or how much you know. In other words, if you really want to improve judgment as individuals and as societies, what we need most is not more instruction, Sorry, Kevin. In logic, rhetoric, probability, <laughs> or economics. <laughs> Even though these things are all valuable, what we most need to use those principles, uh, what we, we most need are those principles, well, is a scout mindset. We need to change the way we feel, to learn how to feel proud instead of ashamed when we notice we might have be wrong about something or to learn how to feel intrigued instead of defensive when we encounter some information that contradicts our beliefs. So the question we need to consider is, what do you most yearn for? To defend your own beliefs or to see the world as clearly as you possibly can? So the emotion of finding the truth must be our guiding principles as opposed to the emotion of feeling good and going with the flow of the crowd. Truth is hiding in plain sight. It is out there. But it needs to breathe. It needs oxygen. It needs a loving hand to expose it. We are programmed to be either a soldier or a scout, but we can change. If we are a soldier, we follow our known narrative and prejudices, aided and embedded, uh, by what we read and what we hear and what we see, and aided or abetted and abetted by social media, who, which is programmed to reinforce uh, those prejudices. We must not seek the interpretation of facts just to support our own prejudiced conclusions. Remember, emotion always trumps logic, even though we may not like it.